guys, I'm here today very late to do my November wrap up. I'm not even going to bother with loads of excuses, I don't really have any, I've been doing lots of reading and not much filming, and that's it. So, it's one of those weird days where it's very sunny but it keeps going behind the clouds and stuff, so sorry, the lighting will keep changing. Sometimes I'll look like this and sometimes I'll look very golden, so I hope you enjoy those two variations. I read 11 books in November, I was predominantly focused on Indigathon and Nonfiction November, but I also managed to read a couple of novels that were on my end of year TBR video, which I'll link up here. I'm doing very well at that and I'm very, very proud of myself. It's the best I've ever done <laughs> at TBR, so go me. So, crazily enough, I have a book for every star rating because I finished a one star book. This never happens because I love DNFing. But this one was such a quick read and I was almost like compelled to finish it because I was so annoyed and also confused. That book is, I've built up the tension very well here, True Story by Kate Reed Petty. So this was on my end of year TBR because I was sent it by the publishers, as you can probably see, this is an advanced reader's copy. And I wanted to try and not carry too many of those through to 2021. I think the final cover actually looks like this. It has like four covers, which is a bit odd makes sense once you've read the book. Let's see if I can explain this. It's very hard to explain. Firstly, I'm just going to say like this whole discussion of this book has a massive trigger warning for sexual assault. So like skip ahead to the next book if you don't want to hear about that because that's literally what the book is focused on. The premise of this is that there are a group of boys in a US high school who are part of some sports team, can't remember what. There are a bunch of idiots they go to drink loads one night at a house party and then they meet at a diner afterwards to sort of discuss their night and two of them say we've just taken this girl home she was absolutely off her head drunk basically unconscious in the car we sexually assaulted her and we left her on her doorstep lol right and then it eventually gets back to the girl they've said this and also to the police an investigation begins and they then say no it was absolute bollocks we made it up because we wanted to look cool i know that's really horrible like whatevs and then that reads like how you would expect it to like a sort of a campus novel pretty almost reads a bit like a ya novel but dealing with a really horrible topic obviously and then it shifts to this woman years later in an apartment i think somewhere in paris maybe i don't even remember maybe rome and she is sort of writing uh, an email to an old friend who is now a sort of famous woman in the Me Too movement um, and makes lots of documentaries about it. And she has been trying to get this woman to um, reveal her story in that she was the young girl in the car who was perhaps sexually assaulted, perhaps not. And then the rest of the book is loads of different formats of exploring that. So you read, you go back, it's all non-chronological and it's all different formats. So there's a big section that are her college application letters. In some of them she avoids talking about the fact that she was sexually assaulted. In some of them she talks about it. Um, there are film scripts that she wrote when she was a teenager. Um, there's a whole section that reads like a horror novel um, about the one of the men who was involved. Um, there's a bit that reads like a sort of crime noir. It's, it's really odd. Um, and I managed it because like the font's really big and really spaced out. And then obviously some of it's like this. So it's like a film script. So I read this um, in two hours. I read an hour one night and I was like, what the fuck is this? I thought it was going to be really literary and really well written. It isn't. It's very easy to read. There's nothing special about the writing style at all. Um, and then the next day I was just sort of reading it out of confusion. Um, and trying to see where it went and I was sort of on a two star rating throughout until the very end um, when something really offensive happened and if you don't want to be spoiled for this then sort of skip to the next book but I'm going to spoil it for people who you know don't want to be it's a horrible thing and if you think oh I feel like I could read this book that deals with sexual assault but then you get to this thing then actually it's fucking awful and this could trigger you so um i won't spoil the whole ending obviously but there is a reveal at the end where she gets to finally speak to one of the guys who was in the car um, and he explains to her that it was all completely made up um, and she believes him and you're sort of left feeling like 
these guys didn't really do anything and they made up this story but they were silly teenagers and she's she's not a victim she never has been so like let it go um and i was really uh, like I don't feel this is the right way to do, like, I don't think in today's context when it's so difficult for people to listen to victims of sexual assault and actually believe them that this is what we should be bringing out. Um, a book where the whole time you're compelled to believe her and then right at the end the rug's pulled out from under her and you um, into you having to believe that that didn't happen. Um, and I read lots of reviews on Goodreads where lots of people who um, were survivors of sexual assault said they found this book deeply offensive and troublesome and they didn't know how it had been published um, so yeah gave it one star would not recommend the next couple I don't have much to say about I spoke about that one for longer than expected um, this was also on my end of the year TBR this is a short story collection called Prickle Moon by Juliet Marillia I'd had this for about six years it was one of the oldest books on my TBR and I have read quite a few Juliet Marillia novels I've had a sort of on off um relationship with Juliet Marillia, that sounded wrong. I loved her first two books in the Seven Waters series. I thought the middle two were good, not great, and I thought the last two were pretty poor. Um, and then I've read another one of her books which I enjoyed but didn't love. Um, but I hope to love more of them. I didn't enjoy this, I gave it two stars. Um, as I said, it's a collection of short stories. Um, some of them are very much like her Seven Waters stories. A, a couple of them are based around characters from the Seven Waters universe um, and, and just feel very much like those books. Um, the, the title one is about a woman who um, looks after hedgehogs in this forest and it's very cute um, and there's a fear for the hedgehogs' lives and she has to make this sort of moral decision. I don't even remember any of the others. It wasn't great. There's nothing special about it. I was bored. Um, yeah, don't think her writing works for short stories and I was very sad. Um, I read for Nonfiction November The Last Act of Love by Kathy Renson-Brink. I've had this for quite a few years and always thought it could be a book I would give five stars to. I gave this three stars. I read it in, I think, one evening. It's incredibly readable. It's very easy to get through and it's a really devastating story. Um, so Kathy was 17, her brother was a year younger than her, they're best friends, um, and in 1990 he was hit by a car um, and thrown quite far down the road and was then um, paralysed um, and sort of unresponsive. And they kept him alive for many years after this in the hope that um, something would, would change, um, perhaps in the medical field or just in his response rate, and obviously put the family under immense pressure. Um, Kathy in particular really struggled I mean you're hearing this from her perspective so you experience her struggles with her um, and you follow her predominantly through trying to care for him with her parents and how they have to really change their lives and then also at one point towards the end of his life she decides to sort of try and make a life uh, to herself um, and eventually they they decide to um, appeal for the right to um, to end his life through sort of ethical um, euthanasia. Um, so it's a, it's a really sad read, obviously, um, and it's very readable, but I found that what I really enjoyed was the start, um, before anything had happened to him, which is just telling you about her family, and you get a real sense of how much she loves these people. They work in a pub, run this family pub, and it's really warm. Um, and actually, once it became more focused on um, the struggles, with trying to care for Matty after the accident. I felt that obviously it lost a lot of that warmth because she's incredibly depressed. It was very depressing to read, but also I just didn't feel like um, the writing style was as elevated as it was at the start. So I enjoyed it, but I just didn't love it. And then I have a few books I read for Indigifon. I read The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. I've heard so many people talk about this this year, so I wanted to give it a go. I don't read horror novels. I used to read loads of point horror when I was a teenager. Absolutely loved horror. And I just don't know what happened. I stopped reading horror when I was about 16. Haven't read a horror novel for absolute years. Decided to give this a go. I do watch horror films. I get scared, but I watch them. Um, so I had no idea how I would react. You may have heard about this. This is about a group of, yeah, four friends who are Blackfeet and they're all Blackfeet men 
and when they are teenagers they go out on the reservation on an area they shouldn't really be and they um, shoot some elk I'm not going to go into the details because I think that's interesting to sort of find out yourself um, and 10 years later I guess they're in their, their 20s um, and they start to sort of be haunted by the presence of this elk um, so I had really mixed feelings about this one the first half I enjoyed lots more and I was wondering if I, when I went and looked at people's reviews, I was thinking I'd hear more people say this, but I wonder if it's just the audience that are reading this book are more like the horror audience than the, um, like I usually read literary fiction and not genre fiction so I don't usually read like plotty fast paced books. So. I'm, I'm not explaining this very well. The first half follows one of the men called Lewis as the elk starts to follow him. He lives off reservation um, and he starts to think something weird is going on and he starts to be very suspicious of the woman in his life um, and it's very clear that he is losing his mind and it's really compelling it's psychologically disturbing and I really felt for him and I was just heart in my throat just thinking please don't do anything you will regret and it was awful to read to like watch the unravelling of this man and there's some really gory scenes which I read and was like fucking hell and like reread them like oh my god like I can't believe that happened so I thought that first section really worked for me and if the whole novel had been that I think I would have given it four stars however the second half is about the other two men because one of them dies sort of very early on and you don't really see that and they are doing a sweat lodge on the reservation and there's a few other people there and it's about um sort of them being haunted by this presence and there's not so much time for character development because after following one person's mental decline you're, you're suddenly following this big group of characters um, in not many pages and I just didn't enjoy it as much and it's entirely down to who I am as a reader and I just don't really love um, action based books um, and something I also found really interesting is that there was quite a lot of sentences I found myself tripping over in both half of the books and those sentences were always sentences that were action based so sentences that were about how people moved across a room or how something in the room moved um, and I don't know what it is, but there's just something about the way Stephen Graham Jones writes action that I can't always follow the first time. And I'd reread it slower, sometimes a couple of times, and be like, oh, okay, yeah, I see how that worked. Um, and I think that must just be because I don't read a lot of action, or I, don't, I don't read any. Um, so my brain isn't as attuned to visualising um, sort of fast action-y scenes. Um, so I think that again is a me thing, but that was definitely something that I kept sort of butting up against and sort of struggling with. Um, so yeah, I enjoyed this. I would probably read another Stephen Graham Jones, um, but I'd read it in the knowledge that I'm probably not going to love it because I do just prefer um, slower, more thoughtful stories than a sort of really fast paced action. And um, I also realised that <laughs> this maybe sounds horrible of me. Um, I enjoyed the scary scenes. I wasn't scared at all. I was sort of um, gleeful about it, which is horrible, isn't it? Um, so I'd like other horror recommendations because I just don't know if I could be scared by a book. Um, so yeah, feel free to try and tell me books you think would scare me because this didn't, but I did enjoy the horror elements, but more in a sort of like, oh, like, um, lol way. That probably makes me sick. Then we have the beast that is the Heartbeat of Wounded Knee, Native America from 1890 to the present by David Trier. So this is um, a response to a book that came out quite a few years ago, maybe like 20 years ago. Um, I think it was called um, The Heartbreak of Wounded Knee and it was um, focused on the Wounded Knee Massacre um, and the sort of premise of the book was leading up to that massacre and then being like oh my god isn't it devastating that we don't have Native American people anymore like Wounded Knee just killed them all off um, and David Truer who um, grew up Ojibwe on a reservation in Minnesota is responding to that and saying actually that's not the case um, this is everything that happened after Wounded Knee up until the present day um, and this is how Native American people continue to live um, so David Truer chooses predominantly to use the term Native American so I will do that for the sake of this book review. So 
I thought I would love this. It has really high ratings. Um, and in the end I didn't and I was very, very sad about that. Um, so I'm planning to pick up um, an Indigenous People's History of the United States. I'll put the cover here. Um, because I still want to learn more. Um, but I want to learn more in a format that works for me better. And I'm hoping that book could provide that. This didn't. Okay. This book is um, 450 pages without the end notes. Um, the font is, is very small, it's a very large format paperback, so it took me um, quite a long time to read. And I was hoping to do 50 pages a day, and I fell off that wagon pretty quickly because I wasn't enjoying it. So it took me a little bit longer, but I still read it in about 10 days, which I was fairly proud of. Um, my favorite section was, bizarrely, the first 100 pages, which actually was about everything pre-wounded knee which i thought was weird because to call a book native america from 1890 to the present and have a quarter of it be focused on history pre-1890 feels like a bit of mismarketing but what the hell and i enjoyed that section the most so i'm not complaining um so it starts from 10,000 bce so you get a shit ton of information how he decides to format that and a big i sort of two big issues and maybe some more minor ones. Um, one of my big issues, and I sympathise deeply with this, is how the hell do you format this book, okay? When you decide to write a history book, it's so hard. Do you go with chronology? If you're looking at a vast landscape like North America, do you go with geography? Do you go thematically, which I think perhaps is my preference? Or do you go with looking at the different groups of peoples? Because bear in mind that there was people with vast differences in how they lived. Um, obviously some of these people um, moved across the land following buffalo. Um, some of these people um, were set in their place and um, fished from local rivers and, and settled. Um, some of these people did a bit of both. Some of these people never came into contact with one another. Some of these people um, sort of regularly got into conflicts and some of them were completely separate from that so these people lived completely differently and I think that is what he really got across in those first 100 pages he decides in that section to focus on regions which I think worked um so he for example would look at um groups who lived in California um groups who lived in the Great Lakes and the Ohio River Valley and those, and those sorts of things and I found that deeply fascinating to understand um, how these people managed to, to live um, and how as people started to move um, into America in all their different ways, you know, initially a lot of them were traders, um, how they sort of managed to, managed to decimate some of these people um, and how some of these peoples managed to adapt more quickly. Um, and I think historically there's been this thing of, oh, well, the, the tribes that adapt more quickly are therefore more successful. You know, we look at that a lot when we talk about evolution. We say, well, the species that have managed to survive, um, that's because they're more successful um, and, and better evolved. It's bullshit. Um, a lot of that is just, is just um, luck. Um, and in part, it's because of a lot of these situations was purely geography. Um, some of these tribes were way harder to get to. Um, they were surrounded by mountains conveniently. Um, some of these tribes, as soon as um, white settlers started um, killing the buffalo, um, and that was something they, they predominantly focused their diet on, well, that makes it really hard for them. Um, so I thought that was all fascinating. However, after that section, this book becomes a mixture of two things, either pretty dry, right? And I was expecting that because this does look like a chunky academic book and I'm absolutely fine with that. If in order to get a lot of information across about a very complicated history, it needs to be a bit dry, I get that. And I would have preferred if the whole book had been like that, but then he would just randomly decide to interview people who are like alive now about something that happened years ago and sometimes it would have absolutely no link. He talks to one of his cousins who is a cage fighter, I think. Some type, I get really confused by all these types of different fighting. He talks to his cousin. I had no idea how that linked. Um, but the one that really confused me the most was he talks to a man about leech farming. This man is an elderly man who um, lives off um, like 
collecting um, different forms of, I guess, produce off the land at different times of year. Sometimes he collects cranberry, sometimes pine cones, sometimes leeches, and he sells them. Um, and that's how he lives. And there's a section where he interviews this man, and I actually skipped this bit. I mean, I'm vegan, so I'm not particularly interested in reading about how somebody does leech farming and how much of a certain type of leech you can sell for a pound. But I, I never skip anything in books. If I'm reading it, I'm reading it. But I looked and I was like five pages about leech farming in present day, bearing in mind we were in a section about the civil rights movement in the 1970s. I was like, how is this connected? It's not. And he'll do things like that. He'll just suddenly switch it to being like, sort of memoirish. And it just doesn't link. Um, and a really big issue I had with those sections is that there's about seven of them. And until the last uh, 50 pages, all of them have been men being interviewed. And they get really long sections. And then right at the end, it's like he thinks, oh shit, I've not spoken to any women. And in the last section, he speaks to two women, but they get such shorter sections than all the men. And that really bothered me. I mean, in general, I don't think there was a very good focus in this book on women at all. Um, I think he focused much more on men. And I even think that like something like um, the residential schools, which you would think would be a really big focus, um, I felt like that was sort of skimmed past a bit. Um, so yeah, it felt like it was um, much more focused on men than it was on like women or children which I didn't love. So yeah, I, I'd give this book like three stars, it was still informative, it just the format um, and the style of writing just didn't work for me. The next one is a debut novel I believe and that is Even As We Breathe by Annette Sanook Clapsaddle. This is set in the... during World War Two. doesn't say precisely when. Um, so Annette Sanook Clapsaddle, I want to make sure I get this right, is a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians um, and she is the first member of her band to publish a novel which is obviously very exciting and this is focused on a young man and he is called County Sokoa and he is growing up um, in a small town called Cherokee and in North Carolina and he is sort of desperate to leave, he lives with his grandmother and his uncle lives very nearby and he really doesn't like his uncle and so he gets a job at local sort of fancy hotel and a uh, another young woman from his tribe gets a job there and she's a similar age to him and they travel there together and they sort of form this connection um, and at the same time as they're forming this connection he's having a lot of complicated feelings about um, home and his relationship with his grandmother and his uncle and um, his father died during the war and there's a lot of um, sort of mystery surrounding that and he's also suffering um, some racism at the hotel um, from one of his colleagues. And so you're sort of following all of that in the first half and it, it feels like a fairly plotless novel that's focused on character development, which I'm absolutely fine with. Beautifully written, there's lots of really wonderful language about the natural landscape in particular, which I really enjoyed. I could picture every room that was described to me. I finished this quite a few weeks ago and even now I can distinctly picture rooms in the hotel that were described. I think she's very good at that. So the first half, I was pretty sure this was gonna be like a solid four star read for me. Um, but the second half just didn't work as well. I don't really want to spoil anything, but so I'm going to say barely anything. There is a group of um, diplomats who are being held as prisoners of war at the hotel by soldiers, and a mystery begins to unfold surrounding some of those characters, and it affects um, the story surrounding Cowney. And the second half of the novel becomes much more focused around that. And I don't know, I just didn't really think it was necessary. I'd also say don't read the blurb of this book because it gives something away that doesn't happen until like the second half of the novel. And yeah, I just, I just found that I much prefer the book before that plot kicked in. And then I found that that plot like took away from some of the earlier moments a bit. I don't know. So I enjoyed this. I'd give it like three, three and a half stars. I'd definitely read anything else she brought out, but I 
100 preferred the less plotty section and that's to make it sound like it's really plotty it's really not um but i'm one of those people who's completely happy with a plotless novel that just has character development um, which is what the first half of this novel was. Then we have a book that I've returned to the library and this was also on my end of year TBR and that is Fawn by Intasar Kanani. I really enjoyed this one although as with quite a few of these books I was really really enjoying it up until the final section. So this was around 400-450 pages. I picked this up because I saw Rincey from Rincey Reads Reviewer. I'll link Rincey's review up here and Rincey was saying how it's a YA fantasy but quite different to a lot of the YA fantasy that's being published currently and that it's very slow and character focused and doesn't really have a big angsty romance which is you know something that I don't particularly enjoy. So I checked my library hand and I decided to give it a go and I really agree with Rincey's recommendation. I think if you are somebody who enjoys slow paced fantasy be YA or adult I'd really give this one a go. I found it really enjoyable and it's yeah, okay so you just briefly describe the plot. We're following a young girl who is a princess of a very small and relatively poor kingdom. Her family are horrible and they decide to marry her off to a prince from a much wealthier kingdom. Um, and on the way there, a sort of evil sorceress turns up and body swaps her with her maid who is horrible. And so when she gets to this new kingdom she's supposed to be a princess of, she is instead um, sent to the um, stables to help to be a goose girl and like herd all the geese and you follow the story from there. Now the big drive of this story is that she knows that the maid who is now in her body is an awful person and will probably be a really bad princess or queen even um, and will be bad for the people and she can tell this kingdom needs a good princess because there's lots of Hovered, horrible sort of poverty and violence happening in the kingdom but she actually really likes her life as a, a goose girl she's made very good friends um, she isn't one to love sort of frivolities and excess and so she's very much enjoying being like a normal person and so there's this conflict in her about what she should do and the first like three quarters of the novel is just a really slow story about her journey there being body swapped meeting all these new people, getting acquainted to her new life and being scared that the prince might like be figuring out that like the princess isn't who she is pretending to be. And I loved it. I was binge reading it in like two days. I was having so much fun. It feels super cozy. But yeah, there's a couple of pretty violent awful things that happen in this and that's something else I really like about it which probably makes me sound twisted. What I mean is I find a lot of the time in particularly YA fantasy you'll get to a point where you think something really awful is going to happen and then it won't because like no it's okay everyone's going to be fine and without spoiling anything this book goes there like horrible stuff happens that you really don't want to happen and yet it still feels cozy I don't really know how that works so I was loving this book I was thinking I could even give it five stars if it ended really well and then the last chunk just got a little bit more plot focused and just a little bit silly so I ended up giving this like three and a half stars there is another book coming out like a follow-on next year which I'm very much excited for and will pre-order and I'd read anything this author brought out because I very much enjoyed it but like I said I just was preferring the slow pace to the fast plot at the end. And then we have four non-fiction books. So these first three were all for in Digifon. This one is very tiny and it is In My Own Moccasins, A Memoir of Resilience by Helen Knott. So I read this for in Digifon as well and this was not quite what I expected but I still enjoyed it and would definitely recommend it. Although these next three I would recommend with quite a lot of trigger warnings. Um, this one in particular. Um, so Helen Knott is a Dane Tsar Nihia mixed Euro descent woman and she lives in northeastern British Columbia. Um, she is one of the 16 global change makers featured by the Noble Woman's Initiative for her commitment to ending gender-based violence. So I knew she was um, an activist who's doing really phenomenal work in terms of violence against women but also in terms of indigenous land rights in Canada and so I was really interested in reading her memoir. This memoir opens with a letter to the reader saying this book is written for indigenous women who have experienced or are still experiencing 
sexual violence um, and abusive relationships and domestic violence. And if you're not one of those people, this book is not for you. If you get something from it, great, but that wasn't my intention. My intention was for people who experienced what I experienced to read this and get some hope. And I thought that was incredibly powerful, thought it was beautifully written, um, and I think it was really important that she put that at the start to make that very clear for the readers. Now, what I will say is that this book is pretty difficult to read, okay? So there's a, a trigger, a lot of trigger warnings in here for like all types of sexual violence, um, including against children, domestic violence, there's a lot of drug and alcohol abuse in here which is pretty awful to read, and just a lot of um, neglect, and it, yeah, it's very difficult to read. And I find most books, like, I don't know, when I read someone's memoir, no matter how awful it is, I'm usually like, well, I know they've managed to write this, so, like, this is really, obviously really sad, but I don't feel too um, disturbed by it. This was difficult, because she really goes there in situations, um, and at a lot of points you can sense that her mind was in such a dark place, you just think, God, if anyone was just there beside you, they could have just taken your hand and walked you away from the situation. But that didn't happen um, and in some cases it was it was because there was someone there beside her but somebody who was in the same place as she was and so wasn't capable of of helping her and she wasn't capable of helping them so it's, it's pretty difficult to read and um, so that makes it a hard read um, but I don't think that should stop you from reading it um, but something that stopped me from sort of really loving this book I guess is that I think I was expecting this to be two things that it wasn't. Um, one is more lyrically written, and actually I would say this book is incredibly accessible, if not for its content and for its writing style. Um, this book is very factual. She states what happened to her, she states how it made her feel, she states what happened next, and she moves on. Um, towards the end, I found some of the writing more beautiful, particularly through her recovery, and she does lots of her recovery through um, sort of traditional um, indigenous wisdom. And I thought when she spoke about that, um, the writing became more lyrical and more beautiful. But um, previous to that, a lot of it was very sort of factual, which isn't my preferred writing style. It feels awful saying this about a memoir. I still really enjoyed this and I'd highly recommend it if you think um, this wouldn't trigger you because I think it would be triggering for quite a lot of people. Um, and the other thing I guess is that I hope she brings out another book because I'd like to know lots more about her activism. This was much more focused on what has happened to her in her life um, and a small section at the end about how she has moved on from that. But it feels very fresh, it feels very recent. And so there isn't a big chunk focused on what she's doing now in terms of her activism, which I was really interested in. And so I was a bit sad to not hear more about it, but that was just um, an expectation I had that the book didn't say it was gonna have. Um, so that was on me. So I really enjoyed this, I gave it four stars. Um, but yeah, like consider whether this is a book you think you'd be okay to read before you pick it up. So the next book is an essay collection that I listened to on audio and that is Growing Up Aboriginal in Australia, edited by Anita Hess. There was four or five narrators for this. I'm gonna have their names come up along the bottom because they were absolutely phenomenal and they deserve to be mentioned. So I started reading this way earlier in the year and I didn't really enjoy it, I read the first couple of essays and I was a bit disappointed and I mentioned that in a video and loads of people said try it on audio, the audio narrators are brilliant and I did and you were right. I ended up giving this four stars, I really enjoyed it. This has about 40 essays I think and they're all pretty short form. One thing I will say is that I think as a reader I do prefer spending more time with somebody, I prefer longer form essays because there's such a limited amount of detail you can get from sort of a five page essay. But I did still really enjoy this, obviously because there's so many voices and they're all talking about what it's like to grow up Aboriginal in Australia, you do touch on the same themes. But instead of finding that repetitive, I found that um, really important because it got across the point that a lot of these people have experiences, have experienced the same issues in Australia because of racism um, and sort of social issues. Um, that the Australian government could and should be fixing. So yeah, obviously everyone's going to engage differently with different voices, so I have ones that really stick out to me and I remember more. Um, there's some in here that are just about a particular day, um, and a day they remember with their siblings or their friends or children in their neighbourhood, 
um, like fun they had and I thought that was beautiful. Um, there's some in here that are about much harder topics. Um, some of these people touch on the childhood um, their parents had and perhaps their abuse their parents suffered in residential schools, which is obviously really hard to read. Um, this again, there's a lot of trigger warnings for this. Um, neglect, sexual assault against children and adults, um, addiction in all its forms, domestic abuse, lots of different triggers in here and this is very hard to read. So these all feel very um, of the moment and it feels like an ongoing conversation which I think is really important. So I'd highly recommend this. I'd definitely say go down the audio route. I thought the audiobook narrators added so much to it um, and I really enjoyed it and I immediately tried to see if I could find, um, this is a series and one of the books in the series is called Growing Up Disabled in Australia and I really want to give that one a go. Uh, I couldn't find it on audio so I will be picking it up in physical copy um, in the next few months and reading it because I'd really like to get to that one next. So I'd definitely recommend this one. And then we have two more memoirs and again both of these lots of trigger warnings. Um, so this next one is From the Ashes, My Story of Being Matey, Homeless and Finding My Way by Jessie Thistle. So I listened to some of this on audio and read some of it in physical format. I'd recommend the audio, it's narrated by Jesse himself and he narrates it very well. But also I found myself wanting to find out his story really quickly and um, I don't tend to listen to audiobooks unless I'm walking so I ended up finishing this in physical form. This is again a really hard read um, in lots of different ways. So you follow Jesse's life, he is now which I think is really important to, to say. Um, he is an assistant professor in Métis studies at York University in Toronto. He won the Governor General's Academic Medal in 2016 and is a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar and a Vanier Scholar. So he is now um, sort of in a happier place and which he does touch on at the end of this memoir. But his life is very hard to read. Um, his mother, was Métis and when they were very young their father was quite violent towards their mother because he was an addict and they end up, him and his two brothers who are very important people in his life, end up living with their father when they're very young and those sections are particularly hard to read because their father will disappear for days, leave them in the apartment with no food um, and they're just children and they're starving hungry and they like managed to get out of the flat and like steal from shops and at one point there's this scene that he remembers where they found like an old like, rock hard turnip in a cupboard and they try and like get chunks off with a knife and as a reader you're just thinking fucking hell they're like five years old this is awful um so they end up going through the foster care system and then they get, end up getting placed with their grandparents their paternal grandparents who they live with for a lot of years but throughout all this um, there's some sexual abuse um, of children, there's lots of domestic abuse and violence, um, there's lots of addiction and depression in his family and then a massive chunk of this book is focused on his sort of teenage um, years and his years when he's in his 20s when he is homeless for a very long time and is a drug addict um, and is in some really harrowing situations. So again, this is very accessible to read. It's very beautifully written. He's a very, very talented writer and I would um, read anything he writes in future. Um, but there's some scenes you think, fucking hell, how is this someone's actual life? Um, there was a section where I was like, what the hell just happened there? And I had to read it out to Johnny because I literally couldn't believe that somebody could have lived through that and like still be alive today. Um, so I will, along with all the other trigger warnings, I will say there is um, an injury he suffers in this to do with his leg, which is pretty gory, okay? So if you don't like stuff with that, like that, it happens and, and then it is um, a sort of ongoing issue with his leg that he comes back to a few times because, because he's homeless, it doesn't get treated properly um, and so he's in a very dire situation in terms of like what's happening to his leg. Um, so if you don't think you'd be okay with reading that, then I would avoid this book um, and any of the other triggers I mentioned, but I thought it was a really great book. Um, and again, he goes through his recovery program with you and it does feel filled with hope um, and love for the people 
he sort of reconnects with. Um, so I, I found there was a, a lot of love and warmth in this, um, as well as lots of just, you know, God, harrowing situations. From all that, you could tell that he began and is now this really um, warm um, and loving person, but just wasn't in the right space to be able to be the person he was meant to be. So yeah, I'd highly recommend this one in both physical form and in audio. I will say the physical edition has photos of him and his family, which um, I really enjoyed looking at. And then the last book is Know My Name by Chanel Miller. I listened to this one on audio right at the start of November. It's one of my favourite books of the entire year. I gave it five stars, obviously. I can't believe I didn't read it sooner. I spoke about this in a video I did recently on my favourite memoirs, which I'll link up here. I loved it. A lot of you have probably already read this. Um, this focuses on the fact, so Chanel Miller was um, known for a long time as Jane Doe in the um, Stanford rape case. So she was out drinking with her sister and her sister's friend on Stanford campus and she was sexually assaulted. And when the case went to the media, it was portrayed as that the absolute prick who committed the sexual assault was the victim because he was like a really great swimmer and he just made a mistake and it was consensual but she can't remember because she was so drunk and it was just the most perfect and devastating example of how fucked our society is when it considers victims of sexual assault and who the real victim is but as well as the actual like I said this in my um, video about my favourite memoirs when you read this, you think to yourself, and I heard loads of people say this, and I completely agree, you think to yourself, even if Chanel Miller didn't have this happen to her, fucking wish it hadn't, obviously, she would have written anyway, because she's such a phenomenal writer. There's so many scenes in this I can pinpoint that I loved her writing. There's one moment where she, um, this is a year or so after the assault, and she's been struggling every day to just get out of bed. Um, and she eventually travels on holiday with her partner, and they go um, diving and they learn to dive and the um, swimming, the, the diving instructor has this thing where he will um, tap, 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 tap um, on his oxygen tank um, so they can hear it under the water and when they turn to look at him it's because he's pointing at some beautiful um, fish or coral um, in the ocean and when she gets um, to the courtroom after that, she sort of visualises th this, this moment as a way to remind herself that this courtroom and this, this thing that happened to her isn't the whole world. And right now, somewhere in the world, all she has to think about is that tink, tink, tink. And she knows that somewhere in the world there's beauty and there's these fish and these corals still existing at the same moment as she's in this horrible courtroom of these complete dickheads trying to um, make her appear to be this, this liar. Um, and the way she just writes that is phenomenal. There's also a moment where they've been in court all day and she meets her sister and her boyfriend afterwards and they just go to a diner and get pizza and I think Pepsi. And the way she describes like the grease on the pizza and then how refreshing the Pepsi is, it made my mouth water like, yeah, absolutely phenomenal. I loved it. And as well as it being a super phenomenally powerful personal memoir, and the last section she really focuses on why she continued with the case um, and her hope for the difference it might make for other survivors, survivors of sexual assault and I thought that was phenomenal as well. So if you've ever considered reading this and like me you've just had it sitting on your TV for ages then please please read it because whilst it's devastating I also find it incredibly hopeful. Um, it, the most hopeful memoir I've read about an awful incident um, and just most beautifully written memoir I've ever read so yeah I'd highly highly recommend it. So those are all the books I read in November. It was a mixed bag but I had a lot of stand-up books and I had a lot to say. thought I was going to do this video in 20 minutes because it had been so long since I read them. Didn't happen did it? This is probably, I guess I'm going to say this is 45 minutes long. If I managed to get less than that then there was some hardcore editing guys. So yeah I hope you enjoyed that and sat through all that. You could have managed to eat your whole dinner while watching couldn't you? So I'm sure, I'm sure that's what you chose to do, watch your dinner, eat your dinner whilst watching this. So yeah, I've got so many fucking videos to do before the end of the year, guys, so you're probably going to get bored of my face in the next two weeks. You're welcome.
Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Let me know down below if you read any of these books and please, please, please give me recommendations for more amazing memoirs, even though I've got about 200 on my to be read list. More fantasy books like The First Three Quarters of Thorn by Intasar Kanani and books about indigenous people's history that I will enjoy more than the David Trier one. Thanks so much and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!